Okay, thank you very much. My financial disclosures are that I have a financial interest in the Artemis technology uh, for ArcScan, and I'm a consultant for Carl Zeiss Meditech. My financial responsibilities uh, are, are, are these. So, our task today is to look at the big enemy of myopic treatment, hyperopic treatments, which is spherical aberration. To look at how the corneal biomechanics change when we make incisions and remove tissue out of the cornea. And then to try and correlate these two to one of either LASIK or a flapless keratinomyces procedure known as SMILE. Now, spherical aberration is obviously a big topic because traditionally people consider that for, particularly for higher levels of myopia, they consider that intraocular surgery is preferable because when they do retrospective or, uh, let's say, Cochrane-style analyses of published papers, they have found that the visual performance in intraocular procedures is higher. Uh, but all of these studies that have been published, even the more recent ones from that Cochrane study, have been using older laser systems that induced way more spherical aberration than modern, current extra laser systems. So this conclusion is not valid at, at this current time. But we have to review, review why spherical aberration was, was increasing and why we weren't aware of this in the 90s. And of course, uh, Michael Morgan and, and Theo published uh, elegantly on fluence projection and uh, reflection errors, and therefore how this would degrade the ablation profile progressively as we go out towards the periphery and cause increase in spherical aberration not expected. Our work around the same time was uh, demonstrating that the stromal thickness was uh, before and after LASIK with a difference map was increasing in the periphery while you were thinning the center of the cornea. And actually our estimation is that this effect uh, causes much greater uh, reduction in the optical zone than the fluence projection errors. Uh, in fact, in our estimation, uh, this is an example of a minus 5 treated by LASIK as a 0.35 micron spherical aberration increase just from stromal expansion. Of course, Cynthia Roberts in the same journal uh, in 2000 uh, published the editorial, which is now very famous, called The Corn is Not a Piece of Plastic where she postulated why we get tissue expansion in the periphery. And we demonstrated this uh, by high-frequency ultrasound, uh, these changes in the stroma um, quite consistently with, with both LASIK and SMILE. If we look at, for example, a 1990s 5 millimeter minus 6 treatment, and we look at the pupil size versus the change in spherical aberration, we see that we made a huge progress when we just went into a larger optical zone, Munderland. When we added a sphericity in the early 2000s, we improved induction of spherical aberration. When we modified these profiles even further, we got even better control of spherical aberration. So this is LASIK. And I'm going to talk about LASIK in its latest form, which is what I will call wavefront optimized LASIK. And I want to be clear that companies that claim that they're doing wavefront guided are actually doing wavefront optimized. Now let's talk about this biomechanics, just in the background of the biomechanics. John Marshall's uh, group uh, published a very elegant study where uh, they created flaps um, and measured the, effectively the change in stress in the cornea. And they showed that for a 90 micron flap, um, there was a 9% increase in stress, whereas for a 160 micron flap, there was a 32% increase in stress. If, however, they made the side cuts only there was only a 9% increase for a 90 and a 30% increase for a 160. So in other words, it was the same increase in stress just making the side cuts. And on the delamination only without side cuts, they found hardly any change in stress. You know where I'm going with this. Because SMILE is a procedure that only makes delamination uh, in the center, well, with some, some vertical cut for the lenticule. So what we did was to invite Brad Randleman to give us the raw data from his study that was published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery 2008, where they measured the cohesive tensile strength of stroma based on percentage depth and percentage of initial strength. And we found that this data had a triphasic behavior as you went in deeper into the cornea. Interestingly, uh, Scarcelli's data, which is actually measuring 
tangential tensile strength also found a triphasic uh, behavior, uh, depending on depth within the cornea. So this seems to be a relatively robust estimation of how stroma behaves in terms of tensile strength. We took the Randleman data and built a model where basically a PRK would be produced by cutting lamellae in the anterior surface, and we would remove that tensile strength, and then what's left, we would integrate and to give us total tensile strength. If we did ablasic flap and then an ablation, what was left under that was considered to be what's left. We didn't get, ascribe any strength to the flap. And similarly for smile, the cutting in the center of the cornea would remove certain lamellae, but what is under and what is above the lenticule would be integrated to give us the total tensile strength relative to the pre-op tensile strength. So this is the model that we used. And if we examine how the model behaves, it does some obvious things, like for example, you've got a 550 micron cornea with a 100 micron tissue removal. Well, obviously, the thicker you make the flap, the less tensile strength you're leaving behind in LASIK. But, of course, the thicker you make the cap, the more tensile strength you leave in SMILE because the stronger part of the stroma is at the front. Likewise, if we look at ablation depth, versus remaining tensile strength. And we set a criteria, let's say, let's leave 60%. Well, that means that we can treat up to minus 5.5 um, uh, with LASIK. We can treat up to minus 9.75 with PRK, but we can treat minus 13 with LASIK. In fact, a minus 14 treatment changes the cornea down to 58% of initial, and that would be the equivalent of doing a minus 6 LASIK with an 80 micron flap. So as you see, SMILE is way more respectful of corneal tensile strength than LASIK or PRK. So if we now examine how these two elements of spherical aberration tensile things behave in practice, what we did is we took a consecutive series of SMILE eyes and matched them perfectly to a consecutive series of LASIK patients. So we had 96 SMILE eyes, 96 LASIK eyes, matched for age, spherical equivalent, cylinder, and pachymetry. We used cap thicknesses between 120 and 140, and flap thicknesses between 80 and 120. Clinical decision was obviously to be giving the patient the best possible optical result, but when we retrospectively analyzed what we did, we see that we were in general using much larger optical zones for SMILE than we were for LASIK. In fact, we were taking 32% of tissue more tissue out with SMILE than we were with LASIK. If we look at how the relative postoperative tensile strength changes according to how much was treated for the two groups, obviously the more myopia we treat, the less tensile strength we left in the smile eyes, but the LASIK eyes were consistently weaker for the same level of myopia treated, of course. How much by? Well, actually, by 28%. If we look at the change in spherical aberration now against how much myopia we treated, smile induced less spherical aberration than LASIK considerably less, actually 64% less spherical aberration than LASIK. Now, one of the features of that as well is that the predictability of how much spherical aberration you're going to induce is much higher for SMILE than it is for LASIK. And remember, we're affecting the mechanics less. And remember I said that I believe that biomechanics are the greater factor in the induction of spherical aberration rather than projection and, uh, and, and reflection errors. If we now compare, just drill down into some details, we look at how um, the different optical zones behave with respect to um, central ablation. Here is the wavefront optimized LASIK as best as we can with a six millimeter zone. That is smile in a six, smile in a 6.5, and smile in a seven. So, in a six millimeter smile, we're taking less tissue than with a wavefront optimized six millimeter treatment, LASIK. In a 6.5 millimeter smile, we're taking the same amount of tissue out as a wavefront optimized six millimeter LASIK. Now, how does, what does that mean? Well, it means that according to how much myopia we're treating, in a six millimeter zone, we, we will induce 
a certain amount of spherical aberration. But in a 6.5, we induced less, and in a 7, even less. Of course, we've known this for years. The larger the optical zone you use, the less spherical aberration you use. Comparing this to LASIK, we found that a 6 millimeter spherical aberration, this is a spherical smile treatment. Remember that these smile treatments are not aspheric. We're, we, we're actually studying aspheric smile now, but these are spherical Munralin profiles. And the 6 millimeter spherical smile was equivalent to a 6 millimeter wavefront optimized LASIK. But it, was taking, it, was, it would be taking less tissue out. Likewise, we learned that a 6.5 millimeter smile removes less spher- induces less spherical aberration than a 6 millimeter wavefront guided LASIK, but with equal tissue consumption, but less spherical aberration induction. And finally, a 7 millimeter smile induces obviously even less spherical aberration with more tissue consumption than a 6 millimeter wavefront optimized LASIK, but still leaving the cornea stronger. So how does this work? Well, it works like this. If we had a 588 micron cornea, and we use a 135 cap, a 7 millimeter optical zone, and treat a minus 10, leaving 250 under the lenticule and 85 microns of stroma above the lenticule. This is a total of 335 microns of stroma, leaving 58% of the original tensile strength behind. If we compare that to a LASIK, this is an act, these are actual eyes in the study. 552 micron cornea, 100 micron flap, ablation depth in a 6 millimeter zone, wavefront optimized, leaving 300 microns, which is what everyone would accept as a reasonable conservative measure, the total tensile strength would have been 44. The spherical aberration induced a fraction at 7 millimeters than at 6 even optimized as best as we can do. And you can see that on topography, six millimeter zone, seven millimeter zone. So what we're saying is that this case here, there's no one who would argue that this case is not acceptable. We've got a thick cornea. We are leaving 300 in the bed. We're making a thin flap. That's 44%. So we've been comfortable with 44%. Let's look at 44%. In 44%, what could we have done in that 588 micron cornea? Well, with a 135 cap in a 7 millimeter zone, we could have treated minus 16 and still leave 44% of the original tensile strength. And that is, despite the fact, as you can see here, for those in the audience, that this is 168 microns under the lenticule added of course, to the 85 microns in the cap. And of course, the spherical aberration induced would have been still a fraction of what we would induce for a minus 10 treatment by LASIK. What about thin corneas? Well, if we were to take a 490 cornea and use a 135 micron cap in a 7 millimeter zone treat minus 10, we would still be leaving 53 micron, uh, percent of the original tensile strength and induce less spherical aberration than obviously LASIK in a minus 10. But of course, we couldn't do LASIK in a minus 10 because the corneal thickness of 490 would not allow that. So in conclusion, in routine clinical practice, larger optical zones are used in smile. Larger amounts of tissue are removed in smile than in LASIK. But smile therefore provides less induction of spherical aberration because of the larger optical zones. And despite 30% more tissue removal, we still leave corneas 28% on average stronger than with LASIK. So in conclusion, the better tensile strength factors of smile allow us to give the patients better optical quality post-op and increase our range of treatments. Thank you. Thank you.